but I just want to now officially welcome you all to the Elementary Science Educator's Guide to the GPB Galaxy. I'm Tracy Wiley, the Education Outreach Specialist for North Georgia. My colleague Michael Kinlan sometimes is able to join us. He's our, our Education Outreach Specialist for South Georgia, but of course our regions are kind of blurred these days, and so you're welcome to reach out to either of us. Our contact information is in the resource list. There's Mike, there's me, either one are happy to help you. Normally, um, you know, he's in the South, I'm in the North, but of course, and when things change, you know, hopefully we'll get back out there to see you. But now, you know, we're both in your homes. So thank you for uh, tuning in and welcoming us into your households today. So again, um, we did a session yesterday on early childhood that was from pre-K through two, really highlighting those um, resources. And now we will be highlighting grades three through five. And it looks like Mike just joined us. So uh, he is here now and you're welcome to, um, he'll be jumping in with some ideas too. So thanks for joining us, Mike. All right, so the goals today, first of all, become familiar with GPB's free digital resources for elementary science three through five. So just how can you find your way to this content? How can you uh, discover it, manipulate it? But also how can you present it in a virtual environment? So we'll have some ready to go assignments, some tools, some strategies as well. So how to pair that free rich content from PBS Learning Media with some, some ideas for, for in, in, you know, engaging your kids and in, in getting to them in this virtual environment. So we're just going to start right away with life science. We're going to jump into an activity that uses very, very simple content, but really can, can be is so flexible. So this particular content that we're focusing on is really great for strategy S3L1, so life science for third grade. And it's all about the regions of Georgia, the physiographic regions of Georgia, and what kind of plants and animals and habitats are found throughout our you know, wonderful state, the biggest state east of the Mississippi, so much going on as we know so many different regions and habitats and creatures so how do we engage our kids in the excitement about our very own wonderful state so one way you can do it very very simply if you have your kids visible and you you have a sort of a, an array of their faces and there's a way that they can just speak up to you either verbally or with you know thumbs up thumbs down there's a great way that you can just kind of check in with your kids with some of these images that are taken from our virtual field trips and just see what they know about different regions. So for instance, if we're doing the Appalachian Plateau, you can just throw out some of these images, find out which kids you know, understand which images are from the Appalachian Plateau. So very, very simple. Again, these are just images from our virtual field trip about the regions of Georgia. So we can ask them to throw something out in the chat box, or I can look at their faces on you know, a, a virtual meeting and have them look at this image and tell me, do they think that this image represents something that can be found in the Appalachian Plateau? So again, thumbs up, thumbs down. You know, this might be like, I'm not quite sure, um, or there are ways in the chat box. So one way that you can apply images. Another image, also all of these from our virtual field trip. Again, just reaching out to your kids, a pre-assessment. Do they recognize what this is? Do they know where it comes from? Do they think it comes from the Appalachian Plateau region? What do they know about the Appalachian Plateau and in terms of you know, things that might grow there or be produced there? Another comment or another image here, a habitat, you know, a visual about, again, um, what might be from one of the regions of Georgia. Do they recognize where this is? Do they see, you know, are they familiar with what a plateau is? Do they see the flat tops? And do they recognize that as a plateau? Or have they even been to this region? Maybe some of them have had the opportunity to go to Cloudland Canyon and will recognize, oh yeah, that's a place that is in my state. And I, I know what a plateau is. I've studied landforms. So it's another way for you to understand what have they retained? What do they know about landforms they can apply in this new unit about Georgia? Do we have plateaus in Georgia? Do they realize that? Or do they associate plateaus with you know, something um, out farther west? And then the last image, again, a little tricky one. You know, Is this from the Appalachian Plateau? It certainly looks like a plateau in some ways. It has that flat top. Um, you know, there's that red clay. Maybe it's from the Piedmont. So there's a lot of you know, confusing information in this. Um, and so it's a great, hopefully a great image that might spark some of their interest because they're not quite sure you know, where this might come from. 
uh, you know, why is it so colorful? There's a lot going on in this image, so hopefully a good instructional hook. So again, just one way you can take GPB's content, just images, and start to spark the interest in your kids just through some simple images and interaction online. So I don't see any chats, but um, imagine that if you did have, you know, an online meeting, you could see their faces and the kids could be interacting that way or speaking up verbally. Now, if we want to do this a different way, if we want to make it even more engaging, uh, there are some great tools in Nearpod that, again, are available for you free. This one's called Time to Climb. And this is um, a way that your kids can do a game, a fast-paced fast game. And in the game, I will present you with two images and we'll ask you which image goes with which region of Georgia. So you have 15 seconds per image to pick which one is correct. There should be plenty of time. And you can see that I can choose whether I want Himalayas or space or underwater. Uh, let's do Himalaya. It's closest to, I guess, Georgia as we can get right now. And what's going to happen is, if you, since you're in the Nearpod with me, go ahead in your student version. I'll flip over to that. And I can see that you've got your student face here. You can pick which creature you would like to be. A bear, a frog, a penguin. Oh my goodness, so many choices, really hard to pick. So you're going to pick your, your creature. And I see that you are starting to pop in. It looks like I am able to turn that music off. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. <laughs> um, so you can leave the music on if you want to have some festive or you can leave it off. So here we've got, oh, we've got a little penguin. Judy, you're ready to go. Thanks for picking the penguin. If anyone else wants to join in, please feel free to pick a character and join in. Oh, we have a lovely frog. Thank you, Mary. And oh, another frog, there's Mike. So we've got two frogs and a penguin, very different. Um, animals here from different ecosystems. So what we're going to do again, as I mentioned, we are going to, you're going to be presented with five different questions, one for each region of Georgia. You're going to look at the two images provided and you're just going to click which image you think goes with that region. So again, it's a very simple activity, kind of like Kahoot, but it's a little bit more engaging. Um, and then I'll just get an idea of what you already know about the regions of Georgia. Now in the bottom corner, I can hide your names. So they are now, you're now anonymous. So when I click on you, I cannot see who you are anymore. So maybe your kids are a little self-conscious. They're afraid that their friends will see what they don't know or do know about the region. So you can do that as well. All right, I think we're ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the start button and then you guys will be able to join in um, and participate in the activity. 15 seconds per question. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, get started. So first one, which habitat's from the Blue Ridge? And you've got five seconds to go. This is a good way for me to see how much time my kids need, right? Looks like everyone's okay with 15 seconds. Question number two, which animals from the Appalachian Plateau? I see how you guys are climbing the Himalayas, trying to answer these questions. And it is, of course, like Kahoot, it is um, grading you on both your speed and your, your uh, knowledge. So that is, uh, again, just another way. I can watch you climbing. I can see how your points are growing. And afterwards, I'll have a report of how you did. So again, hopefully this is just another tool that you weren't aware of in Nearpod that you can perhaps use with just some simple images, simple questions, just to assess the pre-knowledge of your kids. So coastal Plain and our last one, our fifth question, you can see how quickly this is going. So definitely something we can do synchronously. Um, I'm definitely not waiting around twiddling my thumbs while you guys uh, you know, go off and, and do some activity. It's pretty fast paced. All right, so very well done, everyone. So as a teacher, I can see what your points are. I still have you, you know, anonymously here. So I can, don't, if I'm presenting, I don't have to, you know, congratulate or I can say, yay, well done, so-and-so. But I definitely have this information for later and I can see which students are more familiar with the regions of Georgia and which students might need um, a little bit more um, help getting in. Or and I, I can even check and see which questions stumped people. Maybe they're not as familiar with the Piedmont. Maybe they don't know about crops or animals. So I can focus on that. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. This other um, 
sort of activity I want to share with you is just matching the picture. So in this one, uh, this is a very simple matching exercise. All you will do is click on you know, the word to the picture. And it's just another way for you to either pre-assess or post-assess how your kids, you know, how familiar they are with the images. So I'm gonna go ahead and make you anonymous again. So I'm hiding your names. And this will tell me how many matches you have made in how many tries. So again, it's just a way for me to assess you know, how familiar are my kids, either pre-assessing with the, the images or post-assessing how well have they learned. Um, and again, this is completely virtual, um, very quick, something we can do synchronously as well. And when you're done, it'll bold like this. And so you can kind of see, you know, which, which kids are doing, or, you know, having some, maybe have some trouble if it takes them, you know, 20 tries for seven matches, or if they get seven matches and seven tries, you know, they pretty, you know, they're pretty familiar with the content. So again, it's just a way for me to, as a teacher, to kind of figure out, you know, how they're doing and which areas I can focus on for review or for uh, concentrating on when we jump into the unit. All right, I am Mary. I am able to see their names. So if I want to, I can see where at the bottom in the right hand corner where it says show student names. So I can click on that and then I can see everybody's names. So or I can hide it. So it depends on um, if you're presenting like I am to your students synchronously and you may not want the kids to see, you know, who did better or not, then you can make them anonymous, but you can also show them. And then I'll, I can get a report after this and see, you know, which students how they did. So again, just some ideas, just within the Nearpod, using our content from GPB, our virtual field trips, that uh, will hopefully help you engage your kids a little bit more in a virtual environment. So where did I get this content? It is from the Regions of Georgia virtual field trip, one of 34 virtual field trips that we have created uh, throughout the state of Georgia. So you can see on the right here are some more. We have 12 virtual field trips throughout the physical features of Georgia, so things like the uh, Barrier Islands, the Fall Line, um, the Savannah River, uh, the Blue Ridge, the Monadnox, you know, those are various places we go for these 12 physical features. Um, you'll also see that we go to Warm Springs, the Little White House, we go to the uh, prehistoric Indian Mounds, so Kolomoki, Etowah, and Okamulgee, and many more. Uh, this one for right now is five separate field trips within one, so of course the five regions of Georgia, you can see that it is aligned to our Georgia study standards. And we can, I can share it um, via Google Classroom with my students, or if I've, I'm set up via Clever or Schoolicity, I can also share it that way. Or I can just copy the address at the top, the URL, and I can embed it in an email or any way that I communicate with my parents and my students. They do not need an account to see this content. You can see I'm not signed in up here. However, I can still launch this and I can get into the content and explore it. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch it just to show you a little bit more about what the resource looks like since I just kind of wet your whistle with the images. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about um, this particular one and just be aware that all of our virtual field trips are set up in the same way on the same platform. So once you learn your way around one virtual field trip, you'll know your way around all of them. So I'm going to launch this one by clicking the launch button. I don't need to log in. Um, that's only for our teacher edition of the textbook, which is locked because of answers. If I'm just in a virtual field trip, there's nothing locked, it's wide open. So I'm gonna launch it and it's going to pull up again, the virtual field trip. There are many ways that I can explore it. I have this great image right here. I can click on you know, any of these sections and go to explore each of the five uh, regions or I can click on in the upper left hand corner this thumbnail of view. So if I click on that, I can scroll through and see, oh, there's the Appalachian Plateau, Valley and Ridge, Blue Ridge, Piedmont, Coastal Plain. I can click on any of these and go explore them in depth. You'll also see in the upper left that there are these dashes and dots. That's the table of contents. If I click on that, it's another way that I can click. So I can go to the Appalachian Plateau and watch videos, browse through photos, or interact with this did you know little sort of um, fun fact interactive. 
So each section is going to have videos, photographs, and did you know? And at the bottom here, we have a map of Georgia's largest cities, a map of Georgia's minerals, and a puzzle. So my kids can just put Georgia together in the five physiographic regions as if it were a puzzle. So that's how you would find your way through the virtual field trip, either through the thumbnail view, the table of contents, or just you know, jumping from page forwarding and page back, going back with these arrows. So here I am in the Blue Ridge. There's my map of Georgia showing me where I am. I can close that out. Here's a little description of the Blue Ridge. And as I scroll down, I can get more information. So here's a video about the Blue Ridge, relatively short. So I can go ahead and play this video. And you can see it's only two minutes long. So a very, very short video, just an introduction to the Blue Ridge. Uh, I can also continue scrolling down and I will see many photos. So this is where I got some of the images you know, from our, our little exploration. There's the image there of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the fall. Scrolling down some more. Um, here is that did you know section and so this talks about Amicalola Falls and if you click on it it'll tell you a little bit um, some fun information about Amicalola. You can read it or you can listen to it as well um, because there is both the audio and, the, and the, the visual version of this content. So there we go Amicalola Falls and I can click here to listen to it. Amicalola Falls, located in the Blue Ridge region, is the largest cascading waterfall east of the Mississippi River. Standing 725 feet tall, this waterfall is considered to be one of Georgia's seven natural wonders. So that's that. And of course, I can watch the video as well about Amicalola. So there's lots of you know, content which is just embedded in this virtual field trip. The idea of these field trips is to really give our students the opportunity to dive in and do some deep exploration. So they can visit any of the regions, interact to whatever depth they like. They can just look at photos or just watch one video, or they can see everything that is in the content. And as I mentioned again, you know, there is quite a collection of these. So you could just do a, a search for, um, you know, Georgia, maybe virtual field trips. And you'll see that there, if you click on this, it is a collection and there are 68 or 55 videos, 22 web pages, four interactives for grades two through 12. Over here, it has all the different field, virtual field trips broken down. And in the middle, you can click on any of them to explore more and they come with supportive materials for each one. So you can also click on those and see the supportive materials. All right, I hope that um, answered questions. Mike, I'm gonna pause or if you're, see if you're out there, do you have any, uh, anything from the chat or anything you'd like to add at this point before we move on from the virtual field trips in the regions of Georgia? Oh, folks we're just wondering about some of the tools available in Nearpod and whether they exist elsewhere. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for answering those questions. All right, so moving right along, please just keep those questions coming or ideas or, or um, concerns. And now we're gonna go into a little bit more into PBS learning media. So I showed you a bit when I showed you the virtual field trips. But I kinda of wanna start from the beginning and review again, you know, PBS learning media. Some teachers are still getting familiar with it. So I do wanna make sure that you are, you know, familiar enough that you can jump in and start to um, you know, explore it yourself. So here we are at PBS learning media. And I'm gonna go ahead and go back to um, the page here so that I can sign in. So I want to show you the difference between being signed in, as I am right here, and in the Nearpod, I'm not signed in. So remember that you do not need to be signed in to see any of this content. You can watch any videos, play any games, see any of the lesson plans. It is not necessary to be signed in. Same thing for your students and your parents. They don't need to be signed in to see it. These are OERs, Open Educational Resources. They do not require a username and password. However, we do recommend that you as teachers especially go ahead and create a, a, an account because it gives you some nice bells and whistles. You can start to favorite your content that you like. You can order them into folders. You can create assignments, storyboards, puzzles, assessments with some of the tools. Um, you can share things with your classes. You can create classes and invite your students to participate. So it is really great resource, a free um, account again all you need to do is sign up with Google or Facebook or just your email address, doesn't cost anything. So would recommend that you do that. 
once you're in, you'll see there are many ways to find the content. You can browse by subject up here at the top. If you click on that, you'll see all different kinds of great subjects. So science, social studies, math, and ELA, there's your core four. But down below, you'll see there's also some STEM, some health and PE, and this includes social and emotional learning. Preschool, because we know, you know that's, of course, a unique um, area. We're doing three through five now, but you can share that with your preschool teachers. Some professional development for you if you're looking for some tips on how to use this resource. The arts and world languages. And of course, each of these has these great subtopics. So we're here in science, earth, life, and physical, so we can click on any of those. You can also browse by grade. I don't find this one as helpful, but you can go into the upper elementary and maybe look for some content there. And you can browse by standards. So uh, this is, is not um, really terribly intuitive, but um, I find I've, I'm getting more used to it. So just to give you sort of an introduction to how it works for standards, you select your type. So I'm gonna select state, and that is gonna be Georgia, of course. And the document's gonna be the standards of excellence. So I have selected the Georgia standards of excellence on the left. And on the right here, I can type a keyword, such as in this case is, you know, magnet and I can browse for anything about magnets that pops up. I can, of course, select the grades. But what I find is really useful is to actually type in the code of the, of the, the actual standard. So if you're looking for a specific standard, you can actually type in that code, that exact code. So I'm actually gonna flip back. I didn't memorize the code for the one that we just did, but just to show you how it works, I'm gonna flip all the way back to S3L1. Should have been able to know that one. And I'm gonna type S3L1 into PBS Learning Media. So I can just show you how it works. Again, sorry if uh, making you dizzy, all this jumping back and forth. But here we go, I'm gonna type S3L1, do a browse, that didn't work that time, but oftentimes I can type in an actual code here and it will pull up that code. So that one didn't work. Um, so I'm not sure if that means that there's nothing with that code or if it just means, well, it couldn't be, because ours are in there. So again, that's why I mentioned it's a work in progress. We can probably check, make sure that our resources are tagged, but hopefully you can start to find things. Um, here they are now. So if I did a search for regions, yeah, I'm starting to get them. There they are with eighth grade, and there's third grade as well. So it looks like, um, here they are right here, the, re the regions of Georgia. So there are ways it is kind of useful. You just have to play with it and see how it works for you. Another way, um, I'm gonna go back to home. Another way to use this content is of course to search for a keyword. Any keyword um, that you need, you can search for. So again, we could do regions right here and it'll pull up 2,600 keyword uh, search results. Or I can even search for nothing and uh, filter that way. So if I search for nothing, pull up 32,000 results. Then on the left, I can start narrowing it down by science, grades three through five. So I'm down to 3,500 results. And I can even start to pick what resource I want. Do I want a game? Do I want a lesson? Do I want a video? Do I want an image? And of course, languages. There's a lot of Spanish resources. I can choose whether or not I need closed captioning, whether or not there's a transcript in, involved, and even whether or not I can download the video or there are support materials. So if I don't want to you know, reinvent the wheel, I only want resources that come with a lesson plan or come with some teacher tools, I can also click on that. So again, many ways to kind of get to what you need in this resource. So that is a super quick uh, review of PBS Learning Media. I'll pause just for a moment to see if there's any questions or if Mike, you wanna add anything before we jump into some actual content in this time that we have. I think we're good. I would echo your sentiments that I like the subject browse over grade or standard. Yeah, yeah, you kind of sh I showed how clunky it was. Um, but sometimes it does work. I just did a, a presentation this morning and it worked this morning. I typed in the standard, it pulled up everything and I was so impressed. I thought it would work again. Um, so sometimes you just have to try and see what works best for you. But thank you. All right, so moving along, I wanna highlight a couple of things. First of all, one of the, the, way, the reasons why we love PBS Learning Media so much is because of course we all grew up with PBS. Um, and so we all have our favorite shows. Maybe it's Sesame Street, maybe it's Daniel Tiger, maybe it's Curious George, maybe it's the Wild Kratts. So your kids are the same way. PBS is in 98% of households, even children who don't have internet connections or one-to-one -one technology, they uh, have a television and they can watch PBS. Even if they don't have cable, they can see PBS. And that's why it is so accessible. 
And so all these kids will at some point have seen, you know, a show and already having that relationship with the show and the characters makes it much more meaningful when you bring that content into the classroom. So here we are with the Wild Kratz. Of course, many of us remember Zaboomafu. The Kratz have been around for a long time. And you can see in this collection, they're constantly reinventing themselves. So there are 144 videos, 16 media galleries, 10 documents, seven games, three resources in Spanish, a lot going on here. And on the left, you can click on anything that you would like to explore more, whether you're a student or a teacher, because kids have, that can get this as well. So animal behaviors, classification, ecosystems. Um, and as you scroll down, you'll see they do have lots of you know, labs and handouts and lesson plans in English and Spanish. And they also have games like here's an archer fish bug rush where you try and shoot bugs out of the air by spitting water at them with, as an archer fish. Um, there's some creature math. So again, fun ways to get your kids engaged with science and, and, um, and uh, game-based learning. Lots of videos and they're short, you know, again, just a couple minutes long just to sort of get them uh, hooked. And the videos come with support materials. Um, so just, I would take some time and see if any of these will help to meet some of your life, uh, life science requirements um, and get your kids really engaged with the Kratt Brothers. Another rather a newer resource, that one was an old resource, been around for at least 20 years, but this one, Hero Elementary, is new and this is more STEM-based learning. So again, this group of kids, they are in Hero Elementary School. It says K through two. I taught third through fifth grade, and I really feel that some of this content is appropriate for, would have been appropriate for my third through fifth graders. So I did not um, eliminate this from today. I thought I should highlight it for you as well, because it is rather new. I love this because the kids have these superpowers, the superpowers of science. And so it's just another way to get your kids excited about, you know, ob observations and conclusions and failing forward and all the wonderful things that come with science learning. And again, videos and games and hands-on investigations, so much going on here with these new, this new content that they may also be viewing on the television and wanting to see how it connects to school and the real world around them. And then um, this next uh, collection, if you were with me yesterday, we did go over this a lot yesterday, Everyday Science for Preschoolers. It says preschoolers, but I want to point out that um, it, the grade range here is pre-K to four. So again, there is some content here that is appropriate. Here's for third graders and fourth graders. And sometimes again, kids just enjoy animated or live action videos, just a simple introduction to what, be, what you'll be learning, a nice hook. You don't have to jump into the more complex, you know, content all at once. Sometimes it's fun to start them off with some, some easygoing, fun um, content that you can, can start them off with. So short videos, again, with wonderful support materials. These videos can be downloaded. They can be shared via Google Classroom, or you can copy the link or assign via PBS Learning Media. The support materials, background reading, discussion questions, activities. There are standard alignments here as well that you can see when you're logged in. And on the right, you know, more along the same uh, line. So other parts of the series that may be relevant to you. So those are some just general um, collections I wanted to highlight. Some of the more popular ones for grades third through three through five. You can always find popular collections at PBS Learning Media. By doing that, you know, search for nothing. If I pull up everything, 32,000 results, and I click on science, and I click on third through fifth grade science. See, there's a lot of content, but if I scroll down and choose collections, it kind of narrows it down for me, and then I can sort by popularity, and I can see which collections are the most popular. So the most popular right now is actually these Spanish resources, but the next one's gonna be this uh, Earth Science, Earth and Space Science collection of almost 200 resources, and then we've got the Wild Kratz, which is third. So again, that connection to PBS Kids Shows. So that's another way you can kind of find uh, content that's relevant by seeing what other teachers and other students are enjoying out there. So this particular one, Science to You, um, this one is not as well known. It's not on PBS because it's from North Carolina. So we don't have it here in Georgia on our television, but I really think it's a great resource. There are 20 videos and there's nothing, um, there's nothing much that goes with the videos. There are some support materials with them. So if you look at them, there are some, you know, 
student and teacher handouts, but there's not a lot of content. And so sometimes you can find really great content like this and you can pair it with a teaching strategy. So we found, uh, Mike and I have found this collection of teaching strategies. Mike found three different sources where you can go and quite hundreds of teaching strategies and I'll show you where to find those on the resource list. But just wanted to highlight one of them for you and we can do together. And this one's called See No Wonder. This is from Harvard Project Zero. And I do often use this strategy as um, basically an introductory strategy because it is so simple but so profound. And it really works with all different grades. It's a way for you to see what your kids know already. It's a great pre-assessment, also a good post-assessment. It's so flexible. So in this particular one, I'm just testing my children to find out what they see when they look at an image or read a reading passage or a video, what stands out to them? What have they observed? What have they noticed? And they're not, is not necessarily a right or wrong answer, just what um, resonates with different children. The second question I'm, I'm wondering is what do they already know about this content or what have they learned? You know, maybe we're in the middle of a unit and you wanna see what they've retained. So the second question is, okay, what do you know? I'm sharing this video with you. What kind of connections are you making to things we've already learned? Um, or things you know from your home or from your own hobbies. Tell me what you know. And then the third one is what do you wonder? Like do you have questions? Is there something you don't understand? Is there something you'd like to expand upon? Does this connect to a, you know, another uh, course that you're taking or another area that you're interested in? Um, what kind of, what can we explore together? So it's a great way again to find out all different ways that your kids are thinking. So um, I'm gonna share the video with you. I think this one is really fun because it's gross science. And we know third through fifth graders especially love gross science. So here is that age old question, does backwash really happen? And of course, you know, we're in the middle of the scary pandemic, lots of you know, fear and anxiety out there, but we can also maybe just you know, check out the science of it. What, how do we get germs? How do we pass germs to each other? What does it look like? So does backwash really happen at Science U? You notice this little child here has green teeth because they've been doing an experiment on themselves. They have taken some Kool-Aid powder in their mouths and then they're drinking the water to see if the Kool-Aid powder goes into the water as backwash. And of course it does, it's lovely. So I'm just gonna play this short video for you so you can get a, a flavor of this piece of content from Science U. And I wanna mention that I have actually uh, done this video in interactive mode. So in the middle of the video, I have embedded the question, what do you see? So that it will automatically stop and then you can go in and answer the question after the first half of the video, what have you seen? What have you already noticed? And I'll give you a nice break and also make sure that you know, you're starting to process what, the, what you've seen in the, in the beginning of the video. So here we go. You can watch this again on the student version, it says eyes up front. Um, or you can watch in my presentation however you like. I'd recommend the student version so you can um, you know, see what's happening uh, when it gets to that pause. We love science, yes we do. We love science, yes we do. We love science, science you. We love science, science you. When I say science, you say you. Science, you. science, you. What? What's the matter? You drank out of the milk carton and then put it back. When you drink from the carton, you put soot in the milk. Really? We can prove backwash happens by putting powdered drink mix in our mouths to color the saliva. The color swirling around in there proves a little of your spit goes back in your drink. That's my backwash. And what's so wrong with that? Germs. Bacteria. Let's test it. All right, so you can go back. It's a pause here. And if you go back to the student um, view, it's going to ask you the question, what have you noticed or observed so far? You can type your answer here and submit it. And so that's what the students will be seeing. So they're watching my projection on the teacher view and then they can answer on the student view. And again, I can see which students have said what, I can make them anonymous or not, um, but I can get your answers and find out what have you learned so far in that first, um, that first just 70 seconds.
So one teacher has observed, or one student has observed, they're conducting experiments. So um, maybe this is an experiment they can conduct at home. They've got some water, maybe there's some other way that they can color, um, you know, if they don't have Kool-Aid, a way that they can figure out how to color their saliva. Backwash really happens, okay? You can kind of see that happening. Um, so hopefully you'll get some interesting answers as the kids are just participating and sharing with you what they've noticed, um, the things that really stood out to them. And it can be something as simple as, you know, their teeth were green, or it can be something more complex, you know, if, if they know, have a little bit more um, back knowledge. All right, so we're gonna keep on going the second half. To test for backwash bacteria, half the campers drank milk straight from the carton and half the campers, the control group, used a cup. And everybody left milk in the bottom of the carton to test for bacteria. The campers then put the samples in an incubator for four days to grow whatever got into the milk. What's the bacteria when we use uh, a glass? I don't see any bacteria. That's what you know, backwash. Look at all that bacteria. Most of the bacteria in your saliva are either helpful or harmless. But if you're sick and you drink straight from the carton, you can spread those germs to somebody else. So you the glass! So that was less than two minutes long, but it's just a fun way for, you know, to take science and apply it in a real world environment, address, you know, some of the fears we have about contagion and just um, hopefully spark some discussion with your kids. Now another, that was just the C. So the next part, this is a collaborate board and I can approve student comments if I'd like. I'm going to say no this time, but you'll see that I, I do have that choice. And now the next question is, what do you know? So what do you already know about the information from the video? Um, and again, this is really just me trying to assess what my kids know about bacteria or contagion or scientific experimentation or you know, drinking out of a milk carton, whatever they want to share, just what do you already know? And so this is a collaborate board. Uh, my kids will just click on the, if you're in the student version, you will just enter your thoughts here. You can upload images if you like post it, and then uh, it's a way for us to consult and share ideas on this board because we're virtual. And of course, we can't necessarily, it's harder to um, interact, but third through fifth graders can type you know, some, some ideas onto these little sticky notes and um, that way we can start to share. So yes, there's bacteria and saliva. Yeah, I think we hopefully we know, we know about that. So we don't you know, try not to, to lick each other's you know, lollipops or spit on each other. Um, we can easily test whether backwash is real because I actually, when I watched this video, I'd never seen anything like this. So I was like, huh, I wonder, you know, just how dramatic this is going to be. It's pretty dramatic. So you can definitely test that it's real and hopefully um, influence, you know, whether or not you drink out of the milk carton in the, in the refrigerator. Um, awesome experience. You have to steal it. Yeah. And again, we're not together in the classroom. Maybe there's a way that you can get you know little packets of kool-aid to your kids somehow but all they really need is like a bottle of water and a packet of kool-aid so it is hopefully inexpensive and fun and you can imagine just taking pictures of your kids and um, sending them to their parents or having them take a picture of themselves and sharing it with their green teeth um, so a lot of fun all right so that was the no and the next part is the wonder so what do you wonder about the information and this particular one is the uh, called um, fill in the blank and I just want to share this with you because your kids can either type the answer or they can record it or both So again, it just has a little bit of flexibility if they click on the record button They can record their answers and I can you know hear their recording So it's different literacy levels um, or of course they can write their answer and this is what they wonder Do they have questions? What do they want to explore more? What would they like to do just another way for them to give you feedback and share what they're learning? So again, you're welcome to play with that so you can see how it works from the student perspective. You guys are playing students today, so you can kind of see what it would be like on the other end to be answering you know, these various, um, with these various tools. Um, and again, I'm not trying to sell Nearpod. This is just a way that we can take the content that's available to you through PBS Learning Media and share it with your kids in a virtual environment. All right, so we're gonna move along and uh, go into earth and space science. That was a little bit on, on life science. I'm gonna pause just for a minute. Mike, anything to add or share from the chat? 
Um, no, folks are just kind of wondering about more tools and uh, Nearpod and things like that. All right. So let's jump into earth and space science. That was life science. So we're, for this particular one, we're gonna go into fourth grade. So S4E3, obtain, evaluate, and communicate information to demonstrate the water cycle. Um, so evaporation, condensation, and precipitation, some great vocabulary words. Let's help our fourth graders uh, learn about this. So uh, for this one, I wanted to highlight a collection. This one's from New York. Again, it's not something that we might necessarily know is valuable to us here in Georgia, but of course they're studying the same thing. Science is universal, it is a universal language. And uh, this particular one, this is the things that they are studying in fourth grade about matter and the solar system and buoyancy and weather and gravity. So all of this content here um, for grades three, through five and beyond, some of it's in Spanish, images, videos, games. Hopefully some of this is relevant for you as well. And you can see on the left, you know, there's, there's different um, grade levels as well. So you can click on that, which is relevant to you. But I wanted to make sure you are aware that even though this is New York State test prep, a lot of this content is definitely relevant and aligned to Georgia studies. So don't necessarily overlook things that may be from a different state. When it, especially when it comes to science, because of course there are so many uh, parallels among state standards. So um, for this particular one, I got this from the New York State Test Prep, and this is a very short video. And what I love about this video is that uh, there is no narration. It is simply a, a, an image, a moving image um, that you can watch, and so you can do so many things with this again. So what um, I wanted to do for this one is something similar to what we just did. We just did see no wonder. And we don't necessarily have to you know, do things completely different with our kids. We can just sort of tweak the same thing and make it a little bit more expansive. So if my kids are starting to get familiar with the strategy of see no wonder, I can throw this next level at them and say, okay, we're gonna do something similar called see, think, or see, no, me, we. And the idea again is what do you observe? Let's you know, keep on practicing those skills. What do you think about it or what do you know about it already? The me part is how does this connect to you? So how is this relevant to you? How does it matter? How does it connect to something you're interested in, to your family, to your home? Um, just make that personal connection. Why, is, why, do you, why should we care about this? And then the we is what's the big picture? What does this mean for our community, for our world, um, for our, our, our family? Just however can you expand it beyond yourself? Um, and think about the we aspect. So we're gonna watch this video. Um, and again, we're going to try again to think about, you know, what do we observe? What do we see? What do we already know about it or think about it? How is this relevant to me? And how is this relevant to the big picture? So short video, less than a minute. Again, no narration, just watch it. Very short, I can download this video. It comes with support materials, background reading, discussion questions. It's aligned to standards. Um, you know, I can share it with my, my classroom, but again, very simple. I can use it as a pre-assessment, just what is standing out to my kids? What are they noticing? What do they know already about the water cycle? Or it can be to check in with them. What have they learned you know, about the water cycle so far? So see, think, me, we, another way that you can you know, get information from your kids in a virtual environment is with Padlet. If you're not already familiar with this, it's such a flexible resource, it's free again. And I've made four columns, see, think, or see, know, we, me, me, we. So again, what do you see? What do you notice? Uh, you can click on, it looks like this may not be clickable. If it is, I apologize for that. Um, so I just need to go in and change that. But normally there's a plus sign. You click on the plus sign. You can type in what you noticed. What did you already know or what did you infer? 
how does it connect to you? So we've got that, you know, connection here. And then how does it affect us, you know, the community and beyond so you can expand your thinking. So you don't have to give all four to your kids. You can do one at a time, or you can throw all four out there, do it synchronously like we've been doing with people popping, your kids popping their answers in, or send them this lesson asynchronously and let them reply in, you know, in their own time over a period of the assignment. So just another free resource that you can add to uh, you know, your presentation. Now, continuing along these lines about the water cycle, this is along the same thing as 4E3, and this is about the flow of energy in water as it changes from solid to liquid to gas and back. And so those connections, you know, we, we've been doing the water cycle, but we can also just talk about you know, water in general as we're doing uh, the more science. And for this area, I wanted to highlight a few of our interactive lessons, which I think are wonderful. My favorite thing on PBS probably the only thing about these lessons is they are, um, you can give them to students individually and your students can add their work to the lessons and send it back to you. So in order to do that, you do need to have an account. You have to have an account as a teacher and your students need to have an account as a class. So again, you can do this in several different ways. Here I am in PBS Learning Media. I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom here, the very, very bottom. Under learn more, there's a little link that says help. If you click on the help link, it will take you to this section where it says sharing content right here. And under that section, there's a lot of, of subsections. So you can share PBS content via Canvas, Class Dojo, Clever, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, Nearpod, as we're doing now, Remind, Schoology, and Seesaw. So all of these tools work seamlessly with PBS Learning Media. So you can set up classrooms with, with your kids via Google Classroom or Clever or School, Schoology, for instance. And so that's a way that you can um, get your kids into the system and that way they can respond individually and you can see their work. So all of these, if you click on them, it'll tell you a little bit more about how to do it. Or if you have Google Classroom, you know, that really is the easiest thing because all you do is sign up in the right hand corner, sign up with Google link it to your classroom and it's, it's already a done deal. So that's uh, probably the easiest way to do it. So this particular one, states of matter, states of water, I just wanna mention to you that any of these lesson plans that have an animal with a white background, so this penguin, this dragonfly, this duck, this is all the same kind of lesson. And what's unique about these lessons when you launch them, I'm gonna continue as a guest just to show you what it looks like. I'm not gonna be able to get my student work as a guest, but I can explore the lesson as a guest. So what's great about this lesson plan, it says it's 24 pages long, which is definitely overwhelming, but that's because it's actually three different lessons in one, and the lessons are divided by Lexile level. So anything that has that white background in the animal is a Lexile uh, delineated lesson. So if I click on message, menu here, I'll see there's a low, a mid, and a high lesson. So there are three different Lexile levels which is really useful, right, when we're trying to do differentiation in a virtual environment. So the lesson starts off here. It's talking about, you know, the states of matter. Um, and it's, it's just a very brief introduction about that. And there's a little bit more for parents, again, at the end, which is wonderful. So I'm going to just advance to the next page of 24. Don't be, over, don't be overwhelmed. And you'll see here that, oops, looks like I went ahead one too many. You'll see that again, it, it's, it's very short little bursts of text, tells you that we're gonna study these states of matter. There's a glossary term embedded and the glossary is again at the top here. Um, so it says you're gonna go to the next page and you're gonna watch a video. So it's really you know, very simple. This is again for just building kids up, getting them to understand how these lessons work for starting uh, the lesson. And then there's a little video here about matter. So you watch that. And then you go ahead and answer some questions. There's a video again, if you need to rewatch it, name the three states of matter for water and write an example of each state of matter. So just kind of building up. And then we get to the Lexile choices. So you can tell your kids, I want you to do blue, red, or purple, or you know, they can, um, however they want to do it, you can let them choose and try and see how they do. But they'll click on one or the other. So if we click on the, the blue bear, it'll take us to the blue reading at that Lexile level. And so here it is, 
that particular lexile level. And when I'm done reading it, I can continue and I'll continue at that blue level. So again, maybe that was too easy for me. I can try the, the red level so you can give kids some choice. And now this is the activity at a little higher lexile score. And it says, highlight the words that tell the differences. So then I can just get my highlighter here and I can start you know, to highlight the words that stand out to me. When I'm done with my work and can submit it, or if I messed up, I can clear it. Um, but it's just a way for me, again, to share with my teacher you know, what I'm learning. So each page is gonna have something like that, some embedded content, a chance for kids to answer, or some kind of you know, interactive that goes with the lesson plan. And it will guide them throughout the lesson until they get to the end. And at the end, you know, they will have some output or some conclusion. So I hope that's an interesting tool that you may not have been aware of. Again, it's just this tool that's already made for you. Just go through it, see if whether it's relevant to what you're doing, you can assign it to your kids and just another assessment assignment that's available to you that you don't have to create. Besides that particular one, I want to show you that there are others. This one's on hot water and cold water. So again, very similar. It's got the white background, the animal, but there's all this series on water. So when you're getting into states of matter, there's a lot of great uh, resources here. Again, same format. This one has 27 pages, but when your kids get used to this format, of course, they'll be very familiar to them. So all of these lesson plans are designed the same way. This build up, you know, this watch and learn, and then the Lexile scores and the different interactive lessons that are there. All right. And I want to pause right there, see if there are any questions or ideas um, that we've for this particular section, which was um, that we did on uh, physical science, and if there's any questions about um, interactive lessons or anything that we've touched upon. Or Mike, if you wanted to add anything. There are a couple questions. If you could go back over some things. Absolutely. Um, in Nearpod, when you get a bunch of answers during that last activity, can you download them like as an assessment sheet? Yes. So um, again, Nearpod, I'm not trying to sell Nearpod, so I'm not as familiar with the different levels. The silver level is free, and most everything I'm doing today is the silver level. You may not be able to embed a website, but you can, that's a, an easy workaround, especially if you're doing synchronous learning, you just open up another tab. Um, but there is a, a, a way that you can get reports on Nearpod, and that would be how I could go and see, you know, the different data. So I would have bar graphs and things. The reporting feature, I'm not sure, you know, how much of it is at the free level and how much isn't, but there is some reporting available. Um, I can definitely see, uh, so I can see that kind of input. Now, ideally with these, these lesson plans that we're doing, they're not in the Nearpod. So the lesson plan I'm launching, you'll see the results in Google Classroom or Clever because those are housed in PBS. So if that's the confusion, I apologize for that. The Nearpod is really just my structure, but the content I'm showing you is in PBS Learning Media. So you can right. see your kids' results. Yeah, um, okay, a couple more. Uh, for interactive lessons, do they come with a, with a reader? Like, so are, like text yeah. to speech? Yeah, yeah, text to speech. Uh, some of them do. So, for instance, um, I know that there are. You just may just have to. I when I did this morning, all of the ones that I demonstrated had readers. So you may just need to kind of uh, look for different content and find out what's available because each lesson is slightly different. So I did a search for weather, for instance, because I know that there are some on weather, and I'm going to click interactive lesson here on the left as a resource type, and you'll see that um, one of the, if I just sort by popularity, it's gonna be the most popular here is daily and seasonal weather. So I'm gonna click on this one. This is for grades three through five, and it of course does align to our standards here in Georgia. I'm gonna launch this, and this is a, a, another kind of interactive lesson. It's the same type, it's just a different um, developer. With this one, I can click between English and Spanish. So this is great for ELL learners, but you'll also notice that there's this text-to-speech box here. So they'll either read it to me in English, Think of how you dress throughout a year. Or they can read it to me in Spanish. Piensa como te vistes durante el año. So you'll see these that have the text to speech box. You can search for the Spanish easily because if you go to PBS Learning Media, you know, search for nothing to get everything on my left here. I could choose an interactive lesson and then I can scroll down and choose the language of Spanish. 
and I'll see, okay, I have two, it looks like that have that Spanish feature where it translates back and forth. Um, so if I go here and undo the Spanish, you see if there's some accessibility features. There's captions, there's transcripts. I don't see text to speech. If I click on caption, what does it do? So I wonder, these all have captions, so it's possible these might have text to speech. There's quite a few of those. I know that one I did earlier too is about space and that had text to speech as well. So it just depends. Each of these are created by different um, publishers and sometimes they do the text to speech and sometimes they don't. Mike, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, one, one more point that I was just um, kind of clearing up, uh, the length of time it takes to complete these interactives, that's gonna depend on the interactive itself. Some are simpler, some are more in depth, some have more activities, some have less. Yes, for the lessons I definitely would recommend asynchronous. So you would assign it to them on a Monday maybe, give it them a week, um, give them time to go in. They can save their work from page to page. So they can do one page a day or two pages a day or they can wipe it out all at once. Um, but it would definitely need to be something assigned asynchronously. Now, of course, you could show them synchronously how it works, like I've been doing. You can go through the lesson plan together, highlight some things, you know, give them an introduction to what it looks like, give them some, some tips, and then you can sign, assign it asynchronously so they can um, go from there. So I realize, everyone, it is 5 o'clock, um, so I just wanted to, to make sure that you know you're welcome to drop off. I will be sending everyone a copy of the Nearpod scaffolding here. I'll be sending you a copy of the recording, um, a copy of the resource list. But I am going to continue going just so I don't uh, cut the recording off. So I'm going to record beyond the 5 o'clock time, but uh, for those who need to drop off, feel free to drop off, and I will definitely send you, you know, the recording so you can watch the rest of the the session at your own leisure. So thank you for those who are able to join us. Um, and I'm gonna keep on going. So if you'd like to stick with me, please feel free. All right, so the next section is on physical science. So we did life science, we did earth and space science. Now we're getting into some physical science. Uh, specifically, I've been mixing it up a little bit, but just wanna make sure that there is a standard for every grade. So we've done third grade, fourth grade. Here we are at fifth grade, S5, P2, obtain, evaluate, and communicate information to investigate electricity. So for this one, I um, wanted to make sure you guys were aware of simulations. So there are a lot of simulations in PBS learning media. We cannot be in classrooms with our kids right now, but there are ways that you can share some of these great um, you know, online labs. These are free interactive circuit builders, balloon charging, you know, about static electricity, density labs, graphs, um, you know, lenses and mirrors, melting and boiling, osmosis. So lots and lots of these interactives um, that are really well done, uh, do not require flash, so they're a little updated um, than some of the older uh, interactives we're used to. So I'm going to move along and highlight a couple. I wanted to highlight this balloon charging lab, which uh, a lot of fun, very, very simple. You can see on the right there are other interactives that are like it. You can assign it or share it, but it's a way for your kids to go into a virtual environment and simulate you know, the idea of static electricity. So very simple. Rub the balloon on the sweater and you can see you know, the positive and negative charges and what happens and, and talk a little bit about, you know, um, give them some, some information about what's happening. So it's just a way, another way for them to have a little bit more tactile learning than they might necessarily have, where it's mostly audio-visual in this virtual learning environment. This one's a little bit more complex. This is a circuit builder, so it's not just rubbing a balloon, it's actually, you know, building a circuit. They'll need a, they can play around with this, you know, do some pre-assessment, but, but they'll probably need some, some help with this one. So you can see there are all these tools here, and you have to actually, you know, build your wires and, um, and build the circuit and, and measure it as well. So it's a little bit more complex there, um, but again, you can assign this to them, give them some instructions, tell them what you would like for them to do, and then they can go in and they can build the circuit based on your instructions. So if we were to do this, for instance, um, you know, with PBS Learning Media, I might, for this, go ahead and assign it. If I were to share it via, via Google Classroom, for instance, I could click here, pops up my tab with my Google Classroom. I can click on the classroom I want to share it with choose my action, which is to create an assignment. And then when I do that, I can give them instructions. So I can, you know, call this one build a 
And here I can say, you know, I want you to do this. And then I can give them my instructions here. And then over here on the right, I can choose whether I want the whole class to do it or just certain students. I can make it either worth a certain number of points or I can do it up ungraded if I just want them to explore. I can give them a due date, maybe a week from now. And then I can even give them a topic. And when I'm done with building this assignment, there's the link to the content. I can assign it to them and you know, then they can go in and they can work on it. So it's in my class, I can view it. I can see you know, what kind of assignments that I've done. This build a circuit. I can go and check you know, um, who's been involved. So I know that as soon as I send this out to my classroom, you know, my student Michael Kinlan is gonna get right on it, work on this assignment, and then I can give him a grade. So you can see um, your grade there. So again, if you have access to Google Classroom, pretty seamless. That was a very simple way for me to assign this interactive and get kids working on it immediately. Again, I want to show you that there are more, so many more of these lesson plans. So here's one about magnets for older kids. There's that white background again with the animals. So it's going to be a different Lexile levels for this. I can continue as guests. So again, you might really enjoy these lesson plans and might want to use them repeatedly with your kids so they understand the format of these lesson plans. So at this point, we're about to wrap up. I did want to go into uh, the section on careers. So GPB has created this wonderful series called Fast Forward about careers in Georgia. So it's a great way for your kids, especially those fifth graders, you know, there's a section on career exploration. They're getting older as they're getting into middle school and high school. So they want to explore, you know, how is all of this content going to be meaningful for me in, a, in an environment where I, you know, I want to go into a job or into a career and how am I going to use this? So these uh, videos talk about math and science and how they're applied in these actual jobs. And there's this wonderful um, video that connects to electricity as we've been talking about. And I, this is a, a, a strategy that Mike recently introduced to me, which I just love, called Rose Thorn Bud. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to explore a career with electricity and you're gonna be analyzing this career. What do you think is positive about it? What's the flower? What's the rose? What's the sweet smelling aspect of this career? So what would your kids maybe like? What's the thorn? What's the thing that uh, maybe not so nice about this career? Something that's a little prickly, I may not necessarily enjoy. And then what's the bud? So what is something interesting? What, how does it inspire you? So what is something that, you know, that you're just growing into from this career or from this content? So it's again, a simple way for your kids to really focus on, you know, things that are great, things that they maybe find challenging, and then that expansion of questions and inspirations. So this particular video is um, from Southwire, which is a company here in Georgia. They're probably the largest producer of electrical wire in the United States and right here in Georgia. And so this is a great video about them. It is less than four minutes long. I won't play the whole video, but I just wanna play the beginning so you can see the flavor of this content because it's very cheeky, um, not at all serious. It's not interviewing people in this droning voice talking about their work day. Um, it is very kind of silly, uh, but it also does go straight into the nitty gritty of what is involved with these careers. So I'm just gonna play this beginning part so you can kind of see that it is a lot of fun and very engaging. What is electricity? What is electricity? It's a concentration of electro or electrons. Uh, electricity? It makes your lights turn on. You know, centralized towards one source. Electricity is magical, I think. I don't know. I don't like being put on the spot like that. <laughs> Man, that's a tough question. Electricity is, is simply power. You're not going to put that on the video, are you? <laughs> I really love that because it is a hard question, right? What is electricity? And so your kids don't have to feel dumb if they're like, I don't know about this. This is a little complex. They can see there's adults working in the field of electricity who are struggling themselves. And then it goes into more about, you know, exactly what they do and, and it answers the question about what is electricity. But it's just a, a, a great way to kind of to, um, you know, set, set the pace, set the, the, the standard with a very fun um, way to look at careers. So here what I've done for this one is, uh, this is called Draw It, it's here with Nearpod. I've put the video up here so they can, you can access it as students to watch it again.
but I've embedded in here this little three um, column table. And so the kids can go into this draw it function. So as a student, it looks like this. I have this nice little, um, my instructions are here. I can close them out. And then I have my palette here. I can either upload images. I can do text boxes, you know, and, and move my text boxes around here. And I can also use um, a marker. So there are different ways that you can manipulate. You can choose your, you know, the, the, the size of your markers and you can start, you know, writing words or you can draw pictures. Or as I mentioned before, you know, you can type text what in, and move them into each of the columns, of course. So that's how you can get that text box in there. And you can type, you know, what you like about electricity. I love electricity. Or what you don't like about it over here. And then, so it's a good way, again, for your kids to share their ideas with you in this three um, column format. And you can see in progress, I can see when kids are working on it. So if we do it asynchronously, I can watch or I can just collect the, the work later. All right, so thank you guys for sticking with me a little bit longer. I did want to just review, remember that we did create this resource list for you. Um, here is Mike's contact information, my contact information. And as you scroll down, you'll see the different sources of content that we visited today from GPB and PBS. Everything from GPB is in PBS, so I'd recommend if you just want one-stop shopping, just go to PBS Learning Media. You'll find all of this content. We went to Hero Elementary, Everyday Learning. Some things we didn't have time to go through, but they're still here for you to explore. There's Science U there. Um, so again, there's Wild Kratz. So take the time to, to jump around, maybe see some of the content, revisit it, look for some new content. Please let us know if you have any questions or um, comments. If you have time to throw your one thing in there, one thing that you think was super useful um, that you might be able to put, uh, to put in your classroom immediately, whether it's a, a video or an activity, a strategy that we covered, um, something from, from the Nearpod, just anything that would help us know what you found useful. And please do keep in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and of course, um, reach out to us as well with email. Mike, did you wanna add anything at the end here as we wrap up? Just 15 minutes over, not bad. No, that's great. Um, Mary had a question about these simulations. I think there's a little confusion calling them simulations and then they're called interactives. Yes. Um, so yeah, Mary, we would just maybe drop simulations to avoid the confusion. Um, I sent them a link where I just did a subject browse for science and then I filtered for interactives so that you get all of the interactives for science and then you can just change your grade band as you wish to get the correct uh, uh, age group that you're looking for. Absolutely. So again, if I want to search for a keyword or I can search for nothing to get everything on the left here as you scroll down, you will click on interactive. And when it, the reason that I said simulations is because there are different interactives here. When you click on interactive, you might get a game, you might get a simulation like we did with the lab, you might get a lesson. The idea is that it's gonna be interactive. Your kids have to do something. It's not just a video, it's not just an image, it's not just an audio, they actually have to interact with whatever it is. So there's not just one kind of interaction, interactives, there are lots of kinds. And I know that science teachers especially like simulations because it simulates the real world environment in a virtual environment. And that's unique from like a game. You know, a game may be you're pretending to be an archer fish and you're spitting um, bugs out of the air. That's not really a simulation, it's a, it's a game. So I just wanted to make sure you know that there are some real world labs um, that are out there. There's 1,410 interactives and they're gonna be all different kinds of things. So yes, you can narrow it down by science, if you do narrow it down by grade band, you know, I'd, I'd go beyond third through fifth, maybe do second through sixth, because sometimes games that are highlighted, you know, for a second grader are, are still fun for a fifth grader. So I wouldn't limit yourself too much, but even that wider band, we've got 365 interactives, an interactive lesson here, interactive lessons, while this right here is observing shadows, that's gonna be more of a, um, an interactive. That's gonna be where you manipulate the earth to create shadows. So that's not even a simulation, that's like a whole different thing um, where you're just manipulating um, a, a virtual tool. So hopefully you'll find some really cool things there. Thank you, Mike. Anything else to add or clarify? 
I think we're good. All right, everyone, thank you again for attending. Uh, uh, just a clarification, I will be sending you, or a reminder, I'll be sending you this Nearpod presentation. We'll send you, um, again, the recording and another link to that resource list. If you have any questions, just please reply to Mike and I. He'll also be on copy, and you can ask us anything or get any clarifications. Thank you for joining us, and enjoy your evening.